Well, welcome back to these constant contact videos. Uh, this week, we're going to continue going in our systematic approach of going through the Bible. And this time, we're going to talk about what does the Bible say about first fruits or maybe our offerings. In Genesis 4, verses 2 through 5, we're told that when they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground, that is, the sons of Adam and Eve. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flocks. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. That made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Now, much has been said about tithes and offerings, and maybe even more questions come with that which has already been said, like what is a biblical tithe or offering? How much should it be? And then from there, we can maybe get into a great deal of legalism and detail about the topic. But really, I think what we see in the Bible is something much more broad that focuses a lot more on the heart than it is on the actual tithe or the actual amount of money that is given back to the Lord or whatever we give. Now, as we come to the other side of Eden where the fall affects everything, the very first concept, and I kind of find this absolutely fascinating, that the Bible talks about is, you know, Adam and Eve have Cain and Abel, but then the very first thing that Cain and Abel are that we told are told about them is what they've done. They, it seems like they grow up, and then it deals directly with this offering given back to the Lord, or maybe what we might know as a tithe. Really, at this point, it would seem that Cain and Abel have a natural understanding that God has created everything, all the earth, and, and everything that belongs in it belongs to the Lord. And then very little is said about Cain and Abel's offering. And nothing is said why they bring the offering in the first place. Just is the fact that they do so, that they bring the offering. The only nuance between Cain and Abel's offerings is that Abel brought the best portions of the firstborn lamb from his flock. In result, the Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. And ultimately, this leads Cain to murdering his bro brother. Now, there are a few things that we can say about what happens here in Genesis 4. First, Martin Luther said that the Ten Commandments are given in the order that they are because it is not just probable, but if you break any of the nine commandments that come after the first, you are also, in fact, breaking the first commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. Who knows why Cain only offered some of his crops as a gift? But it would seem that at the very heart of Cain's offering is this concern. A concern that the Lord will not provide with whatever is remaining. So Cain most likely withheld his first fruits or his first and his best of what his crop has produced. Because he does not fully trust and he does not believe that God is going to provide with what he has left. In his doubt, he encounters a relatively quick fade, going from what we might think is not that big of a sin, as if there's levels of sin, to be clear, sin is sin, to committing what the Catholics call a mortal sin when his anger rises and he kills his brother. Cain's heart goes from first and foremost a lack of belief in God's character to then that of envy, to then that of murder. Cain's mistake and greatest sin was first and foremost doubting God. Then every sin that came after follows. But that first sin was really the breaking of the camel's back. Secondly, the notion of first fruits is a topic that comes up over and over again throughout the, both the Old and the New Testament. 
And if we are starting with Genesis, we really aren't familiar with the term, and it would be easy to overlook this significant difference between Cain and Abel's offerings. Yet, one thing is for sure, the type of offering that is given is not lost on the author, where he talks about that the best portions of the firstborn or those first fruits, and then how he gives, but then also how God responds to that particular offering. The Old Testament continues to build on this in concepts like Leviticus 23.10, where the Hebrews are given this instruction. Give it the following instruction to the people of Israel. When you enter the land I am giving you and your harvest its first fruits, bring the priest a bundle of grain from the first cutting of your grain harvest. In this case, God offers the land that is flowing with milk and honey, a new creation, if you will, for the Hebrews to once again steward that which God has given. God once again sets a table for his creation that is overflowing. So the notion of an offering of your brightest and best or the first fruits once again acknowledges that every good gift comes from God and whatever will be left of those gifts is more than enough to cover all of our needs. Solomon, equally, in all of his wisdom, reflects on this idea in Proverbs 3, verses 9 through 10, where he says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. Now, if at this point you're one of those detailed-oriented people and maybe a little OCD, you might be asking the question, well, how much is enough? Leviticus 27, 30 through 33 gets more detailed to give us a better understanding where it goes on to say, one tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord and must be set apart as holy. If you want to buy back the Lord's tenth of the grain of fruit, you must pay its value plus 20%. Count off every tenth animal from your herds and flocks and set them apart for the Lord as holy. You may not pick and choose between good and bad animals good and bad animals, and you may not substitute one for another. But if you do exchange one animal for another, then both the original animal and substitute will be considered holy and cannot be bought back. Now, this concept of first fruit is carried forward into the New Testament, but Jesus gives us a slight spin on the idea that helps us maybe even further understand Cain and Abel's story all the more. In Luke 21, verses 1 through 4, we are told that while Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything that we ha- that she has. Here, we see that the heart of giving in terms of how much we trust the Lord, is the core focus of the offering. The Pharisee can spare quite a lot and still have plenty to live off, but they would drop in their coin in that into the collection box, and as the ring would fall to the bottom of the, the box, it would ring out for all to hear so that everyone might look at them and call them blessed. Or at least that was their hope. Jesus, on the other hand, pays attention, pays no attention to the amount of which is given, or that is how much is given, but he pays attention to the person who has nothing to give. She only has two small coins, which in that day was essentially two days' wages for the widow, a coin for each day's wage. But she trusts the Lord entirely by giving everything that she has. Such a person understands that where their treasures lie, and as Jesus says also, where that, that is where truly their spirit will lie. But Jesus says elsewhere that those who sell everything they had for that treasure in the, in the field or truly trust and follow Jesus will find their treasure, will find life. In the new kingdom that Jesus inaugurates, the poor are blessed, and we are told to be poor in the spirit so that we desire the riches and kindness of the Lord above and over our possessions, knowing that the Lord will provide. 
It is my experience, though, and I here I'm preaching to the choir as much as anyone else, that overall we are far more like Cain than we are Abel, and possibly we are even more like Fer- the Pharisee than the poor widow. We are so concerned with how things will be provided for us. And I think this is especially true in today's economy. I've been saying recently that I feel like I go to Costco for the most basic of things, and it ends up being over $100, and I'm just like, what did I just buy? And, and in this type of economy, it would be easy to hold things to our chest and certainly be concerned about what tomorrow will bring. And I know that is true for me, that as you wonder, you know, with interest rates going through the roof, and as we bought up here, I mean, uh, home interest rates were just insane. And it would be easy for me to hold those things closely to to the chest, that if I were to give anything to the Lord, I would just give some of it. Or whatever I give, I wouldn't trust that if I gave my entire two days wage to the Lord, that he would make the most out of what is remaining. Um, That is truly our hearts, I think. That, uh, and I have noticed that many who have a lot to give will sometimes uh, lobby that for their own success, that they'll say something like, well, I give a certain amount of this church, so that means that, well, Isn't that being a lot like the Pharisee? I mean, we have to be very careful with our tithe and offering because we really need to return to the heart of our worship. That first and foremost, why are we giving? Are we giving because the God has called us to and we want to worship the Lord above everything, everything, uh, to, to worship the Lord above everything else? Do we want to worship in spirit and truth with our heart mind, body, soul, and strength? Or do we value other things more than we value the Lord? Do we want people to look at us when we give, or do we want to be more humble? And I think I've already presented all the answers to those questions. Really, when it comes down to tithes and offering, I am typically far less concerned with those specifics. Certainly that is helpful when we're trying to set a budget. But at the end of the day, the question that is lies before us about our offering is, are we giving our first fruits? Are we giving our first and our best, fully knowing that God has provided everything that we have, every good gift that comes from the Lord, that what we get to interact with, that we would then seek that treasure which is hidden, to seek the kingdom of God above everything else, so we might even be willing to give up everything. Boy, that is an interesting call. And yet, the very concept of what the Bible presents about the tithe and offering. I hope this videos and all of these videos continue to be helpful. To give you just a heads up, um, I'm going to do... This week, of course, as you're seeing, but I'm also going to do next week. But at the end of the month, uh, the last week of July and the first week of August, I'm going to be taking a break from these videos. My family and I are going out to Colorado for vacation, and Steve is also going to be on vacation for one of those weeks. Uh, So we're going to truly disconnect um, and take a break from these videos. We'll return, though, when I get back that second week of August. So if you don't see videos those two weeks, don't be distressed. Nothing went wrong. We're just taking a little break. God bless. Have a fantastic week, and we'll see you next week.